Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk again to Dr. Abdullah Ali. You are most welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, Paul. Good to be here again. For those who don't know, Dr. Abdullah Ali is Professor of Islamic Law and the Prophetic Tradition at the famous Zaytuna College in California. And as an expert on Islamic law, he has kindly agreed to discuss the fascinating question, can Islamic law change? So um, this has many facets to it, and in many eyes, it's a very controversial question. So what, what are your thoughts on, on that question, sir? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, yeah, first and foremost, I think it's important to define uh, what is meant by Islamic law. Mm. Um, and typically, we use the word sharia, and people, um, non-Muslims, uh, even know that term today. And it has multiple connotations, of course, in the, uh, the general culture, right? But uh, sharia is one of two fundamental words which are utilized to uh, translate what we call Islamic law. Yeah, the other word is al-fiqh, which is often translated as jurisprudence. Um, sharia is a word which I think probably more accurately uh, translated as um, divine moral code or the sacred law code or revealed law even, right? Uh, and, but the sharia is not only law, right? In the sense that it's not simply a set of rules of those do's and don'ts, you know, things that you have to do and things that you cannot do. But the Sharia is also um, a, uh, a code of ethical teaching, is an ethical code, a moral code in the sense that uh, it also encourages to do things that are not compulsory to do and it discourages from doing things which are not considered to be sinful uh, for one to actually avoid. Um, and um, uh, the Sharia, if we, for instance, um, reference this, the 12th, 12th century scholar, uh, Raghab al-Asfahani, uh, and he speaks about the word Sharia as used in the Quran, he actually says that the Sharia is utilized in two fundamental ways. Uh, one, the Sharia is, um, we can look at, we can consider it to be a, a sort of a natural uh, sort of outgrowth of human activity in the sense that every society, it chooses the path or the moral path that it wants to take in order to uh, promote uh, societal well-being and uh, civilization. Uh, but in the other sense, in the more particular sense, the word Sharia, as we know it, it is the uh, set of devotional and um, uh, ethical uh, prescriptions that the creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has given to humanity, which humanity is expected to embrace voluntarily, right, in order to ensure the well-being of the individual, the well-being of the society, etc., right? So in that sense, uh, the Sharia is much more than simply law. Uh, and, it, and, and actually, if we look at the Quran, we find that uh, the number of verses or the percentage of verses in the Quran that actually are related to what we generally will call law are a minority of the verses, right? You know, that's that it can be anywhere between 4% to 10% or 12% of the verses in the Quran, which are related to particular rules and protocols that Muslims as individuals and as collectives are expected to adhere to. Uh, uh, beyond that, most of the Quran is an ethical book or a book of ethical teaching. It is, it is, it is a book of ethical encouragement, uh, a book of, of parables and stories um, and, and, and moral um, reflection that mm. uh, the reader is expected to uh, sort of take from it. Now, of course, coming back to the original question, we <coughs> should probably also reflect upon the fact uh, that the word Sharia is a cognate of, of course, an Aramaic, uh, I mean, also an Arabic, uh, a, a, a Semitic language which we uh, know as Arabic. And in the Quran, the word Sharia is actually only utilized one time. Uh, 
Sure. Um, there are about five different cognates of the word in the Quran. Uh, but one of the meanings of shara, the root verb of the of sharia, it means to begin or initiate something uh, or to start a path or set upon a road towards something. The sharia linguistically is uh, defined as moridul ma, which is, we can say, a uh, a source of water or the path leading to water. And water, it is a source of both, um, of, of course, nourishment, it quenches our thirst, and it also is a source of purification, right? So we get the idea of what the Sharia, of uh, the ultimate goal is supposed to be mm -hmm. with respect to the Sharia. And we have other cognates like the word Shira, which is, which fundamentally means like the um, the sail of a boat, right? Uh, you know, so in other words, the Sharia is supposed to steer the human being in the right way. Uh, at any rate, you know, so the, coming back to the question of whether or not the Sharia can change, uh, that depends on what we mean by change. Mm. Uh, and naturally, there are both immutable and immutable aspects of immutable and mutable aspects of the Sharia. Right? Some things are static and some thermodynamic. All right. And so the Ulama, historically, they referred to the uh, the static parts of the Sharia as the thawabit. Uh, and then uh, the the dynamic aspects as al or the things that are subject to change, right? But again, what is meant by change? And uh, we can think about that in five different ways, right? right? Because uh, the when we think of the dynamism of the Sharia, um, there are already aspects that we uh, look upon or uh, we can see um, are provide certain adjustments to um, human uh, understanding and practice. Like, so for instance, we can look, about, look at Sharia from the regard of what it can deem to be normative and what is considered to be exceptional, right? And so for instance, the normative uh, law of Islam, of Islam, we call the azaim, uh, when Islam is an azima, these are particular laws that are to be applied in ideal situations when everything um, um, is uh, basically just normal uh, for people. Like, for instance, an example of that would be that um, there's no justification for a Muslim to uh, eat pork, for instance, uh, uh, in a normal situation, or to drink wine in a normal situation, right? But in an, in a, in a, an exceptional situation uh, where an individual is starving and the only uh, food that's available, right, or type of nourishment available to them is something what we call haram or unlawful or something like pork, uh, then the individual, in order to save his or her life, will eat pork, right? Or if a person happens to be choking, right, on food or something else, and the only thing in front of them to drink to clear their throat is wine, then you drink that wine in order to, to, to clear your throat. Now, of course, you don't go more, further than that, right? You know, once your throat is clear, and then you, the whole bottle, no. you just move on, right? <clears throat> so, so that's one way to look at the issue of, of changeability or mutability of Sharia is, okay, well, there's Rukhas and there's Azaim, you know, there's normative rulings, but then there are except, exceptional rulings which are applied in times of duress, times of, of great need and necessity, right? But that in itself doesn't alter the original ruling of a Sharia. In other words, once the conditions re are restored to normalcy, then in that situation, the default um, a ruling applies, right? So that's one a way of thinking about mm. change. Uh, 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 another way of thinking about the issue of, of changeability or mutability of Sharia is to consider the effects of, of, of custom, right, uh, on the, uh, the practice of, of, of people and Muslims, right? Uh, what we call in Arabic, at orf, right? So orf itself is considered to be a source of Islamic law in this in the sense that um, the conditions on the ground can actually change to an extent that the original intent or purpose of a particular law now is no longer applicable, right? Uh, and so, for instance, examples of this are mentioned in books of Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, a common example mentioned in the Hanafi school will be that the Imam Abu Hanifa, for instance, Rahmatullahi um, had uh, had a, an opinion that it was not lawful for a Muslim scholar to take a wage for teaching the Quran, right? 
right? And so he considered that to be unlawful well, during his time. Now, his companions, his students, his disciples, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad ibn Shaybani, later on had, uh, you know, offered a, a different perspective on this and actually said that, well, you know, it's, it's okay for them to take a wage because now what had happened because of the earlier ruling was that no one wanted to study the Quran or not no one, but of course, a lot of people started to abandon the study of the Quran and, 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 and to teach it. And so the fear is that if there are no people teaching, teaching the Quran, then the knowledge of the Quran will be lost, right? Therefore, they adjusted their ruling and said, okay, well, now because uh, this itself, this fear or this new uh, sort of culture has developed, then we have to now offer a different perspective on this particular uh, this particular point, right? Uh, so that's just one of many examples being given. So we so so <clears throat> one type uh, aspect type of changeability or mutability you can think about in, with respect to normal normative teachings or default teachings, and then exceptions are made because of. Uh, ex ex exigencies such as, you know, uh, um, you know, distress and, and those type of issues. Uh, and then one with respect to uh, the change of custom, uh, which is another way uh, to also uh, address this issue. Uh, but, but, but then another um, way to think about mutability of Sharia is with respect to, to the question of the reasons for which certain things have been legislated and whether or not those reasons continue to um, exist in the particular areas where which they'd be applied. For instance, um, let's say the question of travel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a woman, there are hadith that mentioned that a woman, a Muslim woman is not to travel beyond, beyond a certain distance with, unless she has with her a chaperone from her family. Okay. Um, so many scholars say that the reason for this prohibition was because of the fear that the women themselves would be harmed some way, some, somehow because they lack security. Khawf uh, al-fitna, khawf al right? You know, the fear of, of, of for some type of harm coming to them. Um, um, and so because of that, because of this opinion, and those who, who actually adopt that view would say, okay, well, this is the reason for it, and this is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that this itself uh, is forbidden, mm -hmm. or the Prophet said said this is forbidden. Uh, what about if we're now traveling on airplanes, for instance, or we're traveling uh, by vehicles which are much more, you know, where we have people and their witnesses constantly and their there's a general sense of safety right in that situation is it okay for that woman to travel alone without a male chaperone from her family right and so many will say sure she can right so in that sense uh the idea of changeability as applied but it's again we're not talking about uh overhauling the sharia right we're just basically right. saying that okay the illa or the ratio legis hmm. or the efficient cause for this particular ruling um, is no longer exists, right? In this particular circumstance, therefore the rule no longer uh, is to be accepted as, uh, as the standard, right? And then uh, a fourth way to think about immutability or changeability is with respect to the authority of Muslim governors, right? And so for instance, uh, Muslim governors uh, have a certain authority to put a state of execution on certain things, they can standardize certain laws. They can it, they can place limitations on the application of certain laws that uh, are deemed to be uh, or things that are, certain acts were deemed to be permissible, right? As well, and that's within the um, the parameters of what is called siyasa sharia or ahkam al sultaniya, the 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 rulings or the laws pertaining to the uh, sultan or the governors. Uh, but, but ultimately, what we're trying to get at today, I believe, is the fifth, the fifth example that I want to bring up now, which is the question of whether or not the, with the, those aspects of Sharia, which are deemed to be immutable, uh, can they change, right? And so, for instance, uh, is it possible that, say, for instance, inheritance law, right, which oh. um, in many cases, it prefers male uh, uh, male members of the family 
over the female members of the family, even though, of course, it's not an absolute rule. But generally, you know, you will find that uh, that this is the case. Uh, is it permissible now for us to say, OK, this no longer exists. Uh, this no longer is applicable. Uh, and Muslim men and women should receive the same exact amount of inheritance because the times have changed. Um, and, um, you know, it, 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 you know, there some who argue that, OK, the reason why men got received a higher amount or percentage than women received them was because all oh, the men are the ones with the greatest responsibilities or greatest financial responsibilities. You know, but what about today? A woman there uh, today, they're working and they have careers and they don't need men to take care of them. You know, so if a woman is married to a man, she has a job and he has a job and he's not really you know, they're sort of splitting things 50-50. Why can't she be given um, equal inheritance to him, um, uh, even though Sharia, you know, historically says something different? Or to say something like, okay, it's well... Not, it's not, uh, although you say it's the Sharia, which it is, of course, but right. this is detailed in the Quran. This is not just yes. a, some Hadith you're talking about. I mean, right. obviously, if it's Sahih Hadith, that's very, very important. But it's actually in the Quran, which has this uh, differential that you refer to. Right, exactly. Yeah, and, that, and that's a good point to... To even ask the question of how does a ruling become immutable, right? How do we determine the bedrock teachings of Islam? How do we how do we determine the non-negotiable teachings of Islam? And and and, and the ulama historically would say there are two fundamental ways that that happens. Uh, one is because of what we call etawatur, that this is um, indisputable authentic, uh, uh, indisputably authentic, authentic transmission, right? You know, that you sort of diffuse transmission of reports from the early period of Islam. So for instance, the Quran has been transmitted by millions upon millions of people, right? From century after century, right? Until today that we have 100% certainty that this is the book that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the teachings in that book which are clearly not open to interpretation, right? That those become bedrock, non non-negotiable teachings mm-hmm. of Islam. Yeah. So, 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 so we learn uh, what true Islam is by what we receive from the Prophet himself, right? Right. So that's one way we get knowledge that we call the immutable, non-negotiable teachings of Islam. The 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 second way is through the process of ishtihad or scholarly endeavor. Yeah. which leads or results in what is called al ijma, uh, scholarly consensus, right? Now, the second um, way of, of, this is second a way of achieving knowledge of non-negotiable teachings is itself, disp- is up for dispute, right? And for multiple reasons. Now, one, because, for instance, not all Muslims accept or have accepted the authority of ijma or scholarly consensus. For instance, the early Shia, and, and perhaps we would say those today as well, never really accepted ijma as an authoritative unless it is the consensus of their imams, their imams. Um, and then secondly, uh, because uh, the, the fundamentally every single claim of consensus historically uh, has always been qualified in a way, or at least it's understood in a very qualified manner, right? You know, so many books will say that, okay, this is a point of consensus among Muslims. Uh, and, and we have to make a distinction between consensus, which is synonymous uh, with what is called fundamentally meaning those non-negotiable matters that are transmitted by Tawatar to us, right? And then those that are the result of Ishtihad, right? And, and, and the, the, the latter, those that are the result of the Shia had, you know, when scholars said that this is a point of consensus, what they meant by it was that, okay, that this is either the consensus of the Sunnis or these are the consensus of the four <clears throat> Imams or these consensus of one particular method. This is the a major, majoritarian consensus, consensus, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know, so, uh, so that's fundamentally... Uh, the way that that comes about, you know, so yeah, so true, like when we think about, for instance, the matter of inheritance law, which I think is an important uh, example, right, uh, today, that it's right there in the Quran, right, it's in the Quran, and then, and, and then, and I often tell students that, that one of the clearest signs that something is non-negotiable in the Quran mm. is that after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually lists all of the rules. At the end of those verses, he says, Tilka hududullahi fala 
those are the boundaries set by God, so do not transgress them, right? right. So anytime you find that in the Quran, there's no doubt that this itself is not subject to change, regardless of what change of conditions or circumstance or any type of argument that anyone wants to make. You know, so that's, um, I would say, is, um, um, again, the different ways that we can look about or think about the, the question of whether or not the Sharia can change um, um, uh, there are dynamic aspects of the Sharia, but those those which appear to be subject to change are not f- not truly uh, matters that are changing. These are issues, a circum- these are change of circumstance, mm-hmm. not a change in the laws themselves. You know, so in other words, it, it's, it's because the circumstance changes, then the laws are not applicable, right? But once those circumstances return to the ideal conditions, then those rules are still will applied again. But what often when people are thinking about today, when we're saying, that, okay, can the Sharia change? They're saying, okay, let's actually change things that have been known to be part of Islam from the very beginning, right? And that itself is uh, not possible. So the, the answer to this, <clears throat> excuse me, this particular question about change is no, the, the Islamic ruling on the differential between uh, a male and a female is permanent and unchangeable and irrevocable because it's clearly stated in the Quran. And right. e- even if in the West there are different kind of gender roles very recently, perhaps in t- historical time, that's not a reason to overturn is- the Islamic teaching as such because it comes from God. It's not, um, you know, following on the coattails of secular secular values in a particular region of the world. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah, so it's... um. Uh, I think that the what many people, especially non-Muslims, don't understand is that um, mm. the value system of Muslims is st- much different than it is for many people today. And of course, they used to be the same for everyone. But our values were sort of influenced by religion, by theology, in particular uh, monotheism, right? Monotheistic mm. sort of um, uh, based um, uh, uh, morality. Right. And in and, and, and the U.S., for instance, there's this debate, this raging debate about uh, the separation between church and state. Right. And how uh, the uh, the U.S. Constitution is not supposed to endorse a particular religion, nor is it supposed to prevent uh, a particular group of people from practicing their religion. Right. Um, and uh, so when we find, for instance, I say Christians are heads of state or uh, holding public office or Muslims are holding public also office and their religious sentiments influence the way that they rule, um, um, this is often held up as, okay, a violation of the Constitution, right? right? And so while on one hand, it is true that the founding fathers of the U.S., that they wanted there to be a separation between church and state. They did not stay, say that they wanted there to be a separation between God and state. Right? <laughs> you know, because, and that's, I think it's a subtlety that often people yes. miss, right? Because mm. yes, yes. it's right there in the founding documents. God is mentioned multiple times, right? Really? They believe in God. <clears throat> wow, right? I didn't they know that. So, 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 so as an outsider, obviously I'm not American and so on, and many viewers are not going to be from the U.S., but nevertheless, so, so what role or, or, or place, if I can use that language about God, does God have for the founding fathers? If nevertheless the church is to remain separate from state, it's a republic, it's not a uh, not going to be dominated by Christianity as such, but nevertheless there seems to be some metaphysical or theological dimension nevertheless to what they're saying. So how would you characterize it if that's possible to summarize? Yeah, I mean, of course, I mean, many of them had various um, belief systems, right? And not everyone was a Christian, but, you know, they believed in God, right? The, these, right. these founder fathers, right? Uh, and um, they believed that morality and religion had a role to play in the success of this project, you know, of self-government, right? You know, and like, for instance, one famous uh, letter or a part of a letter, excuse me, from uh, former president uh, John Adams, he mentions that, um, I'm paraphrasing him, that he fundamentally says that, that the constitution or the success uh, of, 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 of the American project, you know, and the constitution is meant to be 
uh, applied by people who are religious and they're immoral, right? And and unless you have a religious and moral people, it would not it not it would not work. Right? It can only work if people are religious and moral. In other words, um, people have to believe in a higher power. They have to believe in a uh, someone or something which actually can call them to account and 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 they they'll be reckoned for uh their misdeeds in this in, in, you know after they die and they leave this world right and one of the fundamental mistakes i believe has been made in western countries and especially in america is the embrace of what we call liberalism or liberal thought which fundamentally allows for pretty much anyone religious or non-religious to actually hold office right yeah see uh, if we believe that a particular type of government mm-hmm. is the ideal type of government, uh, that suggests that we also want that type of government to survive, right? And so we're talking about tradition, mm-hmm. right? And if we want to, and the only way to ensure that a particular political tradition, it survives, mm-hmm. is that you have to scrutinize the, the those who are seeking office, that you have to ensure that these individuals who believe in the assumptions, uh, the philosophical and moral assumptions uh, of the Constitution, uh, of, the, of the those things that are utilized to rule society. You know, so this is one thing often it comes up like with non-Muslims when they uh, want to attack Islam and Sharia. They say, okay, well, under an Islamic government, there will be minorities, people will be discriminated against. They'll have second, second class citizenship, right? You know, but um, though pretty much that's been the case for all of human history, right? Uh, and the current status quo hasn't done any, any different, right. right, in that particular regard. And I would argue it's because the human being um, finds it impossible to do so. It is impossible to for you to one hand to say, I want to preserve a political or a moral tradition, uh, while at the same time allowing for people to actually hold office who actually may undermine that tradition and then and thereby undermine society, right? right. So, <clears throat> so it's, um, it's really interesting, um, I think, um, discussion to have, right? No, but, I think it's but, also interesting that the famous uh, English philosopher, John Locke, um, who I think was in the uh, 17th century, who's hugely influential in the United States politically, uh, in Definitely. terms of even influencing the constitution, I understand he was um, a great advocate of tolerance uh, I, I, and all these things. But he was very clear that atheists were not to be tolerated. They would have no rights. Uh, yeah. They were just not fit for office. Yeah. And, and you know, this was the great apostle of tolerance. And he was quite clear because how right. can you trust an atheist? How yeah, can you right. possibly trust these people uh, to be moral? Because uh, you can't, because they have no fear of God. So this is often, often overlooked by uh, in John Locke, who's seen as a uh, a great advocate of liberalism and tolerance. Indeed, he was. That was a very good point. But also, he was very clear: you cannot trust atheists, and no, they do not have political rights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's a very good point. You know that mm. that people don't understand just how much nuance existed and how much um, deep. I, reflection went into actually trying to establish the type of country that uh, the Americans uh, attempted to, uh, of course, establish and was somewhat successful, right, in, in doing it, you know, but um, there's going to be discrimination, right? You know, there's going to be, because that's, that's the only way for you to ensure that your particular tradition, it, 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 it lasts. Like, I mean, think about it like this. Uh, let's imagine in the Muslim country, right, mm. which, you know, we define ourselves as Muslims uh, and we want to live according to God's law, right? But we allow to be the head of state, right? A person who doesn't believe in those things, sure. or a person who uh, places no value uh, on those things at all and actually want to overturn it and revolutionize Muslim society. No, yeah. we say, no, you can't hold office, right? Now, we may be able to uh, use you in some lesser office, some lesser role, but you cannot have yeah. mm. uh, a, a role where your influence uh, leads to undermining Muslim culture, Muslim belief, Muslim religion, right? You know, so, and, and, and I think that while we are, you know, claiming otherwise, right? You know, quite often, when I say we, I mean, though we are in the West, 
uh, those who are not Muslims, especially that we actually are, of course, we were a society where we treat everyone equally, everyone is born, of course, equal, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the, functionally, that is not the case. It has never been the case that, um, that, is, that it has worked that way. Right? I so, think it's, it's interesting. I, th- I think you're absolutely right. And even the political left and the liberal uh, political left, who are very much against discrimination, inequality, unfairness, and would protect the rights of people, free speech. But they today, it can be argued, are the most clear example of those who are the most intolerant and discriminatory against those who don't agree with their views. So those who hold traditional moral views, say on on marriage and gender roles and so on, are routinely attacked and uh, deplatformed and censored. Mm -hmm. Uh, They lose their jobs. It happens here in Britain, doctors, teachers. Most of the population now are afraid to speak out. I'm sure it's true in France and in America, all in the name of liberal tolerance and freedom and non-discrimination. So you're creating a new class of discriminated against people. uh, Mm -hmm. And the crime now, the only thing you can't be is to be traditional. Um, So where is the non-discrimination, inclusivity, affirmation of diversity when it comes to views that the liberals don't agree with? It doesn't exist. So it's actually a myth. Uh, All they've done is replace an older orthodoxy, which they didn't like, with a new orthodoxy, which they do like. But both orthodoxies had the acceptable and the unacceptable opinions, and the the latter were always disadvantaged. And at best, those who held those views were second-class citizens. So we're not really seeing the emergence of a new liberal tolerant order. We're seeing more of the old same order, just a different label, a different set of values, but we still have the second class citizens. And if you're a traditional person, whether it be a Jewish person or a Muslim or a Catholic, you definitely are a second class citizen now because you can't publicly assert your opinions anymore. You've got so you're put, you're suppressed. And that's a way of being second class or even third class in our modern free society. Right. And and, and I think it's important also to highlight, like, for instance, um, when we consider this, the fact that there's always going to be an orthodoxy and there's always going to be a, a, I guess you would say a, um, an elite, right. A ruling elite, right. In any given society, financial and otherwise, right. Or both. Right. Um, that to an extent you can understand why, for instance, in the earlier America, there was uh, discrimination against, Jews, discrimination against Catholics, discrimination against Muslims, right? Because, for instance, once again, it's like, okay, well, we are, what they saw is that we are are creating a new type of political order, right? And we have to ensure that the individuals or those people actually, actually, who actually uh, are holding office in this political order believe in uh, the ideal, right? They believe in the preservation of this, in the, you know, so, so having a history with Jews for one, okay, you know, but these Protestants are, okay, well, Jews, I mean, they, you know, they, they killed Jesus, right? The way they saw it, you know, or th- so they couldn't be trusted or the Catholics, the Catholics persecuted them for so long and they fought an entire war for more than a century, right? Between with the Catholics, you know, you know, it makes sense that they would suspect that they would have an allegiance to the Pope, right? And again, I'm not trying to justify sort of inequality, but it is really interesting that this this phenomenon happened. And with Muslims, of course, they have a long history with Muslims too, right? So why would they give Muslims right access to, to this power, right? And of course, this time has changed, and you know, it was it was a it was a great opportunity, I guess you would say, but. Um, but I, w- I do want to come back a little bit to, again, the question that we're dealing with here, the issue of Sharia, right? And I do want to make uh, another distinction here. So when we talk about Sharia, uh, um, sometimes Sharia is synonymous with what is called fiqh. Other times, um, Sharia is what we can call sort of a revealed law, right? In other words, what the prophet was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, and then the prophetic teachings, his, his sunnah, we would say, right? That is just Sharia. Right. And so so the Sharia in one sense is revealed knowledge, but in another sense, the Sharia is interpretation, the interpretation or an extension of that revealed knowledge. Right. Because right. the Quran was revealed with um, clear, you know, unequivocal, 
univocal uh, statements, but also with ambiguous statements, right? And so the ambiguous statements are subject to multiple interpretations, mm. all right? And so while one would say, okay, well, those interpretations are not Sharia, well, they originate from Sharia, they're an extension of the Sharia. So for that, they qualify as being called Sharia. Right? So this is why we have different schools of Islamic law, and they legitimately can be called schools of Sharia as well, uh, fundamentally because they are an extension of the text, you know, or an interpretation, the interpretations that come from the text, they are codified in those different schools, right? So, so I think that's an important distinction too. But uh, when we think about fiqh, uh, often what people say about jurisprudence or fiqh is that it is speculative, right? And one thing that was very interesting about the early scholars and for most of, and also scholars from most of Muslim history is that they didn't see themselves as legislators. Right? Mm. So for instance, when we think about government today, we've got legislative branch, executive branch, there's the judicial branch, right? You know, so there are human beings who legislate, right? For human beings, right? Um, the scholars themselves, although they played a role of legislators for the masses, for society, they had the obligation, right? The, the, the religious obligation, the moral obligation to not deem themselves to be legislators. In other words, the way they saw it was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only legislator. <clears throat> God is the only legislator. And the mufti, or the, we call the mushjahid, has the role of clarifying, right? Elucidating or disclosing what is hidden, right? And so in other words, God has already ruled, God. right? And he has given us signs and tokens in his scripture, in his book, right? Uh, about newer events, newer issues on how to actually uh, um, um, to discern what his judgment is, right? So the scholar goes through a process. Uh, huh? Yes, yeah, yeah. an important point. So scholars are not true legislators because God is the true legislator. The Quran obviously is very clear on that. How different from the West, mm -hmm. America, Britain, and so on, where mm -hmm. men and women are seen as real legislators who actually create laws, sometimes mm -hmm. unprecedented laws like uh, certain kinds of marriage and so on that have never seen, right. seen before in the history of mankind. And they feel mm -hmm. they can do this. But a, a mufti or a mufti he doesn't have that authority, that role, that self-perception. His role is to implement, uh, as far as he understands, for the masses, what a particular God-given uh, law actually means in this particular example, in a particular situation. So it's a quite a yeah. different conception of law, isn't it, within the yeah. Islamic paradigm than in the Western paradigm? Right, right. Indeed, indeed, it, there is. I mean, it's um, uh, God sets the standards, Mm. Um, whatever is moral is determined by God. Of course, in the mainstream Sunni tradition, of course, we do have this debate that, you know, we, we have an earlier episode when we talked about um, the question of the Mu'tazira and how they approach this issue, right, of natural law. Mm. Uh, but the Sunni mainstream, the position is that, that uh, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only God can determine what is compulsory and what is unlawful, right? What is lawful, what's unlawful, what's compulsory, uh, and what is forbidden, that it's only God who can do so. Now, of course, the human being has the ability to discern, you know, proximate and remote harm uh, that or benefit that comes from a particular action or decision, right? But it is God ultimately who legislates and says that this is lawful, this is unlawful, this is compulsory, this is forbidden to this is forbidden to you do, for you to do right. So so Imam Shafi has a famous statement when he's actually he's uh, and this is in his Risala, his famous book of Risala, where he's actually uh, attacking a certain type of rational uh, tool that was popular among the uh, the Hanafis called istihsan, and he actually says laysa lil musharra laysa lil and yusharra that the mustahid has no right to legislate. The mustahid has no right to legislate. And whoever employs istihsan has legislated, right? So this was 
Imam Shafi taking aim at that, but the, the first point is a point of agreement that the mujtahid, and this is accepted even by the Hanafis, that the mujtahid has no right to legislate. Because mm. uh, um, only Allah Taala, He is the legislator, and so there are multiple verses in the Quran that mention what in illa lillah that the judgment belongs only to God, right? That God, He is the one who judges, right? So, mm. so, so, the, so, the, so we do make this distinction between what has been revealed uh, and what is univocal and what is uh, interpreted, right? Uh, and so, generally, when we think of the interpreted aspect of Sharia, we call that fiqh even though it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, as I tried to highlight, right? Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, so we do have these different viewpoints between um, classical Islam and perhaps we can say classical religion to an extent, perhaps if we think about Judaism, perhaps, uh, but um, um, maybe not Christianity, but... Um, it's complicated. Is fine, right? It's more complicated with Christianity, and you would know better, better than, I, than I do, uh, but it's much more complicated... Uh, 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 but but when it comes to to, to Islam, uh, the Quran is very clear, right? That God is the the judge. You know, God is the judge in these matters, and the human being uh, has no right to declare something to be halal or something to be haram. As a matter of fact, Quran says you know to do so would be to attribute a lie to God, right? You know, to to do so, right? Um, it says one verse actually says that. So, gosh, gosh. so it's um, really. Um, an important topic. Mm. Right. I mean, uh, are there any examples of rulings in Islamic law changing in the modern world, which are consistent with what you're saying? Or, or, or we, uh, is, there any, is there any wiggle room at all, if I can put it that way, in the modern Western context? Or, or I mean, we're dealing with d different incompatible paradigms, aren't we, really? But right. uh, and that's quite a pessimistic view in one way, in terms of the existential realities of living in the West. Um, but I, I'm just trying to think of examples in terms of je, je, uh, the way marriage works, perhaps uh, the way men and women relate to each other. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. even the example in Saudi Arabia, I don't want to get into controversial waters here, particularly, but mm -hmm. when there was uh, there used to be, I think, a prohibition on women driving on their own. I think mm -hmm. that's now been rescinded. Right. Um and that was mocked in the West, of course, but it was actually based on a principle in Islam about women. Well, you've already mentioned what the principle was about yes. protecting women from right. harm. And that's a good principle. It's not a bad right, principle. Right, right, but whether right. or not it's appropriate in cars, as opposed to other situations, is, I guess, the question. So th there is some, is there, so that's the question, is there some flexibility in those areas? Or we really are, are we at a, a clash of paradigms here with no, I was knowing to with but no. Well, yeah. Well, naturally, uh, the this, the Quran doesn't say anything about driving cars, right? Yeah. And uh, the rules of driving cars. Um, uh, fiqh or jurisprudence is generally classified in two different um, um, two different categories. So, for instance, we have what we call ibadat, and then we have what we call ma'amalat, right? So, ibadat is what are devotional matters yeah. of devotion, and then what we call we can call interpersonal. Uh, transactions or interactions, right? You know, overall laws that relate to civic and interpersonal interactions between people, right? The bulk of Islamic law is the latter, right? And the default with respect to those, uh, according to the vast majority of, of scholars, is that they are permissible until proven to be unlawful, proven to be uh, um, um, impermissible. Uh, so, for instance, the question of whether or not a woman can drive, of course, it doesn't come up in the Quran, doesn't come up in the Sunnah. Right? No. However, scholars, due to their conditions and their understanding of the text, have ruled in, in like, for instance, Saudi Arabia in the past that, OK, women can't drive, uh, not because they're women, but because of a sense of trying to protect both their own honor. Right. Because, for instance, if she's driving especially they say, for instance, if she drives a taxi, right? That she drives a taxi and male, there are men who get into the car and mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. and now she's um, in what we call a khalwa, right? A, a sense of seclusion with men and that has expressly been prohibited yeah. uh, in Islam by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Uh, now, of course, I mean, yeah, I don't agree with the ruling, you know, but yeah, I, it was, what it needs to be understood is that there is a rationale, however, exactly clumsy or however um, unsophisticated rationale that undergirds that, you know, that we should not just simply discount it 
um, and simply backwards, uh, just yeah. at first glance. Similarly, yeah. similar is the case with, like, for instance, the Burqa and Afghanistan under the Taliban. Um, and so, and preventing women from going to school. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I, as I stated before, that I, I, um, I prefer not to criticize, um, you know, foreign cultures, right, for what they do, yeah. uh, especially mm-hmm. before I fully understand what was the impetus, what was the catalyst for yeah. those type of things, right? You know, but, but, but my understanding, according to my understanding that when the Taliban, before the Taliban had come into power, and this is before the Gulf War and things like that, well, before the uh, 9-11, uh, that when they actually imposed these type of restrictions, that Afghan society uh, was very decadent in the sense that, you know, women were being raped and, mm. um, and uh, it was it was widespread, you know, a lot of harassment and abuse for mm-hmm. women. And the Taliban, according to my understanding, I could be wrong about this. You know, what I was taught was that uh, they had implemented this particular um, practice in order to protect women, keep them inside. Right. You know, until they're able to clean society up. You know, maybe the plan was to keep it that way forever. Right. Um, but, you know, again, there is. There does seem to be some rationale uh, which is um, is understandable, right? You know, to an extent, right? When you consider uh, um, um, everything that's happening, you know, so everyone doesn't can't be like the West. Uh, everyone uh, or everything about the West is not good either, right? You know, there, there's still. I mean, again, when, when we do comparisons, we know uh, with regard to. Um, moral decadence, societal um, decay, crimes, crime statistics, uh, uh, murders, right. rapes. Right. Uh, exactly. you know, the list is very long, and you compare the statistics in the West with the Muslim world. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So, so again, so, <clears throat> so, 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 so they, you have these divisions. You know, they have the devotional area, the areas of devotion, which we say the default is that it is unlawful to create a new act of right. act of after devotion, act of devotion uh, it, without you know evidence. You know, the interpersonal civic interactions, the default for most scholars is that it's permissible for one to engage in such things until um, uh, until evidence is proven that such things are unlawful for you to engage in. Uh, so 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 so, you know, something like marriage, for instance, uh, it has its own definition Islamically, it has its own definition historically and in the language as well. Right. So. Mm. Think of like, for instance, and in, uh, like gay marriage, um, you know, that uh, we know that it's legal, right? In many Western countries, right? Uh, mm. But from a strictly Islamic standpoint, um, the definition you know, would not, uh, it would not be valid because the definition of marriage is not fulfilled, right? Because marriage by is very different. The definition is between a man and a woman, right? So even if in the West that the authorities validated that from a strictly Islamic standpoint, um, it would not be valid, right? Um, um, even if socially acceptable, right? Mm. I mean, socially acceptable is, and acknowledged as a valid marriage or this person is the husband of the person, this is the wife of the other person, you know? So, so there, there are many different areas. Of course, I, I don't want to make uh, things difficult for you because I do understand that it, like in the UK that some of these discussions uh, are much more um, um, hard to have, right? Than we can in, in, in the in the US and uh, 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 you know um, it, you know uh, and, and in other ways you know you have more freedom too, right? You have more freedom in certain areas and other areas you have less freedom than we have in the US. With regard to these you, issues, but you've got a constitution that protects your right to free speech. We don't have that here. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> there's a slight difference. Uh, but even even in France, where there's right to free speech, there is not much free speech on many issues. So you know what it says on paper and what happens isn't always the same thing, unfortunately. Uh, right, right. But, so, no, but I, so I, think, I would say a couple more things. I mean, I just want to say uh, before, like you know, you move towards yeah. whatever um, type of questions. In addition to the questions you have, is that um, that uh, another difference between Sharia and normal legal systems is that for Sharia, every act of the human being is, is, is um, every act of the human being has a moral value, right? Mm. That God assigns to it, right? 
right? You know, so everything you do, like even you're shaking your head right now, you're putting your hand on your face, all of that has a moral value. It has a ruling, right? You see, right? And, um, uh, and Islam is paternalistic, right? In that sense, mm-hmm. right? So, and, but we take pride in it being pater- paternalistic because we're talking about the following guidance from our creator, right? You know, he created us and, and without us asking and created the conditions under which we live, which are ideal for survival, uh, and why not be grateful, right? You know, show gratitude to that in some particular some particular form, right? Um, and often when people talk about Sharia, as we know, they equate it with we call it the penal code, if we can mm. call it that, right? In the, in the, in mm. Islam, but Sharia is more than simply a list of punishments, oh, or yeah. or and a fatwa is not. Um, some type of edict which is given to kill someone, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, as, as many people would say. Right? That's, just, so that's just a mistake. That's just a cultural mistake about another right. faith which people in the West don't understand. It's uh, right. just ignorance. Yeah. <clears throat> right, right. So yeah, there's just a couple of points I wanted to include here. Yeah, sorry, thank you. I, I think, I mean, the danger of opening up a whole new can of worms, but the, the, uh, what, what one issue is the classical position in Sharia of offensive jihad um i mean can that be changed in the modern world is it something that i mean how does one negotiate that in, in particularly when was there's an asymmetry of power arguably between the west and its cultural and military hegemony and the muslim world which is very much on the back foot um we're not like dealing we're not we're not in the classical uh muslim era at all now um mm-hmm. So, I, so, so even the question itself might seem strange, given the asymmetry of power, the radical inequality of military and cultural power that exists in the world. But um, is it something that is held in abeyance because of that? Or should we look to change the Islamic teaching in that we are now in a new situation? Do you see what I mean? How, how does one approach this new context we're in, do you think? Right. Well, there, as you know, I mean, there are many people, even Muslims and some of them scholars, who claim that um, <laughs> jihad is only defensive. Uh, but that's not true. We know that. I mean, there were offensive, offens- offensive um, the campaigns held by the Prophet himself, Ali Salatu Salam, right? And and um, so so, but the understanding. Uh, that we take is that jihad requires a head of state or a commander in chief, right? In order to, uh, or just someone who uh, is acknowledged as a uh, a um, a leader, right, uh, of the ummah, right, who actually has the power to declare war and and also to um, to make peace as well, right. So jihad is not just a bunch of vigilantism, right? The people just running around killing people because, oh, okay, I don't. This person disparaged the prophet, so I said, and this person said this and said that. Um, no, that's not jihad. That's we call sort of vigilantism, mm. and Islam doesn't endorse that, right? Mm. Islamic law doesn't 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 really endorse that. Um, and uh, jihad itself, but the prophet Muhammad sallam. Uh, he said in the very famous hadith, a jihad madan ila yom qiyama, that jihad is effective until the day of resurrection. Right. right. In other words, it's immutable, right? The jihad is always applicable and it and, and it's like all other rulings, is applicable under the right conditions, right? Applicable right. under the right conditions. Right. That's the ca- that's a crucial caveat here, isn't it? Right, right. <laughs> exactly. It's like everything else, you know. I mean, you find uh, examples of like Umar ibn Khattab, in his particular reign, during his reign, he had, did many things that some people accuse him of contradicting the Quran because of those actions, right? Yeah, I mean, one particular action he took was that he put a stay of execution on cutting off uh, the hands of thieves right, during the time of, of, of hunger, right? And as some argue, they call the reason the Omar Khattab, his reasoning was based upon what we call Maqasid theory, right? The issue of the objective of Islamic of, of, of obje- objective of Sharia, you know. But um, realistically, it wasn't rooted in what we call the Maqasid. It was actually rooted in the text, mm. right? There actually was an incident that happened in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where um, there was a uh, 
most of the Sahaba were suffering great hunger. And so one companion actually went and stole some food from the orchard of another man. And so that man caught him and he beat him and took away some of his, some of his belongings. And then when they came to the Prophet, وسلم, uh, and they were asking that the man be punished for this, the Prophet said that, you know, that this was done out of this individual. He did this out of necessity. He did it out of, out of, um, out of a sense of, of, of duress, right? You know, and so he didn't punish him, you know. And so Omar ibn Khattab was simply following the sunnah of the Prophet. And I think that this is a misunderstanding which mm-hmm. has to be cleared up, that it wasn't Omar applying some sort of high-level uh, philosophy, right, to this mm-hmm. particular incident. It was him following the sunnah, what he knew and understood of the sunnah of the Prophet. So even though the Quran is very explicit, that you cut off or the, the, the hand of the thief, male or female, right, if they... If they uh, if they um, commit theft, if they steal something, um, but we have a lot of these other conditions, you know, about the item itself, you know, what type of value it has to have, and whether or not it was locked away or secured, et cetera, et cetera, and all the things come out of uh, the uh, the sunnah, they come out of the basic uh, rules that govern, right? The we call the Islamic penal code. But but coming back to jihad, but jihad is definitely is something which was expressly stated by the Prophet as being um, not subject to negation, you know, that jihad is a principle, right? It is a a rule, right, that Muslims um, have to apply, right, under the right circumstances. And if if, if there is no jihad, then you can't um, you can't defend your religion, you can't defend your person, you can't defend um, what is uh, your your tradition, right? It is one of the ways of preserving Islam is one of the ways of preserving life, right? And I remember some years ago, uh, I gave a, uh, a lecture at um, University of Pennsylvania, and this was close to right right after 9-11. Um, mm-hmm. And there are a lot of Christians who came and they were, you know, they were bashing Muslims during that time. And they were saying you know, that any religion that allows for you to do jihad and it can't be from God, right? And I remember um, they don't obviously never read the Bible, have they? It's full right, right, right. of had all over the place, and not right. just, just wars, but genocides. You know, I mean, right. uh, sorry, it's just so ironic when people in glass right. houses, you don't throw stones if you're on a glass house. That's my advice to those people. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah but I remember like just pushing back, you know, and I, and I tried to appeal to their them the, the rationally too, and I said to them, I said, okay, well, you're this 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 assumption or this claim that you make that a religion. Uh, cannot be from God if it endorses uh, war, warfare, right? And I said, where does that come from? Yes. Does it come from your Bible? Nope. Does it come from, or just come from your own personal sentiment, right? You know, because, you know, because um, like you said, like you said, you know, the Bible has all of these issues there, right? You know, with regard to, to war, warfare. No, but even further than that, you know, um, what about injustice, right? Mm. You know, what if there's injustice in the world, right? What if there are oppressed people in the world? Um, so God does not want people to be, you know, liberated from their oppression and their tyranny. Uh, and, and, and if the only way to do so is for you to, to wage war, it was what we call jihad, then, you know, to me, I think that it's, you know, that is actually good that God actually gives us rules of conducting warfare. Yeah, right, because I mean, the Christian tradition itself developed some quite sophisticated just war theory, <clears throat> mainly with right. people like uh, Thomas Aquinas in the third right. century, drawing on some thoughts by Augustine about just war in the fifth century. And right. that's been developed much later in the Catholic Church as well. And th- there are causes you, know, you can go to war in certain circumstances and how you treat uh, non combatants and civilians. There has been developed much later than Islam, but nevertheless, it was developed. But uh, well, whether or not it's found in the Bible, I, I, I don't think it's there, but it's there in the later Christian tradition. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So, yeah, <clears> it's um, <throat> definitely, um, definitely uh, again, one of those areas, once again, alhamdulillah, I'm glad that we sort of, we've, we've trans, we've, we've, we've uh, gone, be, gotten beyond that phase, right, where people are constantly trying to attack Islam on the basis of, okay, we have the doctrine of jihad, Okay, you have the doctrine of just war, or or as a secular person, you actually invade people and kill millions of people. Have done so, right? Millions of people since the start of the twentieth, well, even prior to the twentieth century. Right? You've been 
uh, invading people and um, and cause cause much more bloodshed than religious people have 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 caused in the past, right? So, or even the present. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, there's uh, definitely a lot of things to to talk about. Not naturally, in a an hour, two hour session, you're not going to get through everything with respect to Sharia. But I I'm hoping that we're able to get all of the essentials uh, with, with respect to Sharia. Uh, and um, yeah, so I do appreciate you um, giving me the opportunity to speak about that. No, well, well, thank you very much. I just mentioned I spoke to Professor Jill uh, Haywood yesterday about uh, war <clears throat> and religion in the Islamic tradition and the Christian tradition, which mm-hmm. looks at some of these issues uh, concerning war uh, in more con- in, uh, in much more detail as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, like you, actually, he <clears throat> he's an expert historian on uh, Islamic history, and he said the the idea that um, which is gaining popularity in some Muslim circles. Um, that the Prophet's military campaigns were purely defensive um, uh, and that Muslims today should be even sort of pacifist in, in there is completely wrong. Uh, and and he was quite unashamed in asserting that there were uh, um, offensive or expansionist jihad taking place. And he, he explained the reasons why that happened. And once you understand the historical and the other reasons why, then it makes a lot of sense. And it's not something to be ashamed of or right. apologetic about. There are good reasons why it happened. Um, mm-hmm. And that kind of that was quite refreshing to hear some facts restated rather than a kind of apologetic retreat into a kind of quasi pacifist view that is shared by some Christians and others. You know, that's not Islam. Yeah. That, that's a, an right. innovation. Right. And especially if you're living in a world where the pres- there's a presumption of war, not a presumption of peace. Exactly. Right? You know, so like exactly. you, 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 you live in the world, but at any time, anyone could just invade they can kill you. They can take you as a captive. They can take your your wife, your children, right, as captives and make them into slaves, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so what else were they to do, right? What else were, were they supposed to do? Just sort of sit there and wait for someone to invade, to invade them, you know? And it's not as if they were invading, just kill, slaughtering people, right? That's the other part, too, is that, okay, yeah, they, they, they take over lands, but they're not slaughtering people. They're just saying, listen, okay, we're in charge, right? And we want to guarantee the safety of ourselves and of you, right? As long yeah. as you pay tribute or, again, you form an alliance with us, right? That's fundamentally the way that that, that pre-modern world was. Yeah, exactly. And Islam wasn't, Islam in sense of compelled belief was not yeah. spread by the sword. On the contrary, uh, right. people were permitted un- under law to practice their own faith, and were not told to convert, uh, uh, and and indeed they didn't uh, uh, initially. Uh, over many hundreds of years, people did convert, but there was no force to, and even a disinclination because of because there's revenue from uh, uh, jizya revenue. You know, there's right. even a, a disincentive from um, seeing right. the populations convert to the faith. So it's actually yeah. precisely the opposite right. of what is popularly seen in the West as uh, Islam spread by the sword. Yeah, you're right. Of course, the the top level, the rulership level. Right. was taken over uh, and Muslims again don't have a problem with that perhaps because you know it got, Islam is being spread justice has been spread uh, uh, throughout the world and and that is not a bad thing from a Muslim point of view right, but, uh, right. and it took and then it took centuries in most places that are now majority majority Muslim population it took yeah. centuries for that to become the norm right you know so it wasn't as if okay you were, we're in charge now. All of you people now have to become Muslim, right? you know. And but just history sort of belies all of that, right? So why did it take so long for all of these Muslim societies, the major, Muslim majority societies that, that exist today, to become Muslim, right? You know, if they had been forced, compelled to become Muslim, then we'd have seen that much earlier in in in, in history. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, perhaps we can leave it leave it there. I mean, we could go on for hours, but I think I think there's, yeah. a, there's a there's a lot here for people to uh, digest, and I think you've established some fundamental principles, the immutability of the revelation of the Quran. Um, and some things are not really up for change. Uh, but there, there's some things that are, but these are temporary to do with necessity and extreme right. circumstances. Once those circumstances have gone, we're back to the normal application of those. They're not really changing the law. It's uh, it's all to do with context, right. I guess, really. But, right, um, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Abdullah Ali from uh, Zechina College for your expertise and your time and your lucidity in explaining these uh, really complicated uh, and controversial subjects. So thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Take care. Till next time.